Well, good morning again, everyone. Welcome to church at Cross of Life. If you haven't met me, my name is Caleb. I'm the pastor here on staff. And we just celebrated our soccer camp this past week with the theme, Unshakable. We spent five days teaching kids about the unshakable love of God uh, based on a Bible verse from Isaiah 54, Isaiah 54, verse 10. I'll read it for you, and then we'll talk about it today. Isaiah writes on behalf of God, Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. This is God's word. This week, I interacted with a lot of people under the age of 20. The 200-plus campers who were all ages, well, 3 really to 14, and then all of the coaches, most of whom were under the age of 20, it was a week of hundreds of young people, and it was great. I I love kids under the age of 20. My previous position before I was pastor here was a teacher at a high school for our international church body. I love working with kids because there's an exuberance, an enthusiasm about young Christians that I think as as we start to get older, we, we lose in some ways. And so to see their smiling faces, to see them repeating back to me what I had said in the message, it was wonderful. But I know that behind all those smiling faces, behind that good work ethic. All the statistics say that kids under the age of 20, who are now being called Gen Z, are some of the most depressed, most anxiety-ridden, most suicidal people in our society today. The research is finally starting to come out as these kids start to come into adulthood, all those who had been born in the year 2000 or later, and the numbers are staggering. And we might wonder, like, well, why? (laughs) Why are they they so depressed? Why are they so anxious? Why is there a spike in suicides in this generation? I mean, they have everything that they could want. We, We live at the height of this society. Well, I'm sure there's a number of reasons, and not all the reasons are true for every single person, but the research is starting to say that it's because most of their life is shakeable. There are many things that are true about growing up in the 21st century that aren't as certain as they were in the 20th. Now, there are numerous, but I'm going to give you four just to help you understand what it's like to grow up as somebody born after the year 2000. This is a a culture, a, a generation of people who have a different understanding of consistent income. While the minimum wage has stayed pretty consistent since the 60s, adjusted for inflation, the cost of living in this country has skyrocketed. A recent study of students in 2010 from Ontario and the Maritime Provinces said the average student graduating from those provinces has $28,000 in debt by the time they finish university. Many of you who grew up a generation or two earlier made it through your higher education without any debt at all. And I'm sure you could blame a number of things, right? You could say it's because of the schools, it's because of the government, it's because of work ethic, whatever. That's not the point. The point is, that's their experience. They understand school is something that takes a lot of your money and doesn't give it back very quickly. Second, this is a generation that grew grew up with a shakable understanding of safety. This is the generation that grew up post 9-11, where terrorism was something that was talked about regularly. They've done more active shooter drills in the past year than many of you have ever done in your life. They're the generation who's talked to about bullying, both in a cyber way and in a uh, physical way. They're the generation whose main concern when it comes to those who are getting close to voting age is gun control. This is a generation that does not always feel safe. Third, this is a generation that has a shakable understanding of family. They're a generation raised by a highly divorced generation. 
They understand what it means to go to dads for a weekend and then moms for a weekend. They understand what it's like to have step parents and step brothers and step sisters. They're also growing up in the age where we've redefined marriage. So the idea of one man and one woman, that's not always the norm for them. And we can argue about it. We can talk about the theological implications and you know, how this thing has caused it or that thing has caused it. That's not the point. That's their experience. They've grown up with a shakable understanding of what family is. Where many of you, if you're older, you grew up having an understanding that you fit into a family. Many in Gen Z don't have that understanding. Fourth, they have a shakable understanding of consistent community. We live at one of the most transient times in our country's history. StatsCan says that 40% of all Canadians have moved in the last five years. And that's even higher in areas like ours, where the housing market is higher priced and there are more immigrants. Most kids will have moved three times by the time they're 10. Which means that if you grew up on the same street with your same friends and you've known them for decades, that's not the experience for many Gen Zers. They're used to switching schools, to moving and making new friends. And they're used to a friend culture that's built, in a lot of ways, online. So that they don't have that same personal interaction with their friends. And as such, they've become the loneliest generation in the history of our country. Across the board, across all generations, statistics say that 50% of Canadians have one or fewer people that they really trust in their life. That's even higher when it comes to Gen Z. They have a very shakable existence. But it's not just them, is it? Well, it might not be all four of those things for you who are over the age of 20. It's some of those things, isn't it? Whether it's, it's moving or broken relationships or not being sure where the money's going to come from to pay the bills, there's much in your life that is shakable. And so God gives us some beautiful words that cut through the craziness of our shakable life. Those words that I read earlier. Though the mountains be shaken or the hills be removed, yet my love for you will not be shaken. My covenant of peace will not be removed, says the Lord. And let me give you a little bit of context for those words. Isaiah is a big, long prophecy book, and this comes towards the end of that book. As God is, through the prophet Isaiah, looking forward to the end of Israel's current situation. This is about the 7th century B.C., where these, these words were written, to Israel while they were in exile in Babylon. See, God had given a promise to the world. When Adam and Eve first fell into sin, God said, I will send a Savior who will forgive all of your sins, who will crush the head of Satan so that he has no power over you. But a couple thousand years later, God specifically tied that promise to one nation through one man, Abraham. Maybe you remember the story, God took Abraham out and made him look up at the starry night sky and said, can you count the stars? That's how many people are going to come from you. And God made good in his promise. Through the next couple generations of Abraham and his son Isaac and his son Jacob and his sons, all 12 of them, God grew the nation of Israel. But about 500 years after Abraham, the Israelites were taken into slavery in Egypt. It wasn't their fault. The Egyptian government at that time was particularly tyrannical. But even as they were in slavery and made to do work that was beyond their capabilities, God still grew their nation. In fact, so much that the Egyptians had to start killing the young Israelite boys just to curtail their population. Eventually, God released Israel from bondage and slavery in Egypt and set them on a path to a piece of ground that they could call their own where they could grow and thrive as a nation. He called it the promised land. When they got there, they definitely did thrive. All the way through, about 500 years after Moses, a man named David, maybe you remember him as the guy who swung the sling with the rock and killed the giant, he became the greatest king in the history of Israel. But after David died, slowly but surely, 
God's people forgot him. And as such, they forgot God. They forgot all the good things that God had done to make them a nation from one man, to bring them out of slavery in Egypt, to bring them to a promised land that could be their own. Slowly but surely, they forgot him. And it wasn't overnight. It wasn't even over one year. It was the slow drip of letting one little thing come into your life that, well, it was supposed to coexist with God. It's not that we stopped worshiping God, but well, we could also worship this. It's not that we wouldn't give some things to God, but we want to give some things to this as well. And drip by drip, slowly but surely, the nation forgot about God. And God warned them, but they didn't listen. And so to get their attention, God let them be conquered by two nations, Assyria and then Babylon, to be scattered across an area that was supposed to be their own but no longer was. That's where we pick up this story. And into that fray of a scattered nation occupied by another nation, God says these words. Though the mountains be shaken or the hills be removed, my love for you will not be shaken and my covenant of peace will not be removed. What beautiful words to hear for a nation who had completely messed up, who had thrown away the good things that God had given them, that God's love was unshakable for them. But I'm guessing your life is a little similar. Like you grew up, you you had an idea of who you wanted to be. Maybe you were going to shoot for the stars. You were going to be this person, married to this type of person, with this type of job, making this kind of money. You'd live in this place, doing this thing. Whatever it was, you had a vision, right? Of what you wanted to be. And somewhere along the way, something happened. Maybe it was your fault, maybe it wasn't, but it forever changed your course. And that vision that you had of what you wanted to be, who you needed to be, it became almost impossible to achieve. But you didn't stop trying, did you? You kept working at it, putting in more hours, going on more dates, trying to find a different job, so that you could achieve that thing that you had set your heart on. But you never achieved it. I mean, how many of us could stand up right now, raise our hand, and say, my life is exactly how I planned it? We can't. That's because we live in a world of multiple gods. Not that all of them are true. There is only one true God but that we have taken all sorts of little things and drip by slow drip, included them in our lives and said, God, coexist with these things. And those gods, they, they can never provide you what you actually want. They can never be enough for you. No matter how much time or effort or money you put into them, they can't be everything you want them to be. But for some reason, we continually try to get those things to, to give us what we want to extract from them what makes us feel good. And it's exhausting. And we live a life in a world of shakable love, of shakable acknowledgement, of shakable compensation. And yet into that fray of craziness, God says these same words to us, though the mountains be shaken or the hills be removed, and my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, my covenant of peace will not be removed. Though the marriage be broken or the kids don't turn out well, though the money runs out or the job isn't what I want, the house is too small or the car won't get paid off, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken. That's what we taught those kids, 4 to 14, all week. That God's love is unshakable. And so today I want to give that same message to you in three points. The gospel of Jesus Christ is unshakable. We're going to talk about the nature of it. We're going to talk about the uniqueness of it. We're going to talk about how it can change your life. Okay? So, the nature of it, uniqueness of it, how it can change your life. The nature of the gospel is this way. Jesus talked about it by telling a story. A story of two brothers. One younger, one older. The younger brother once went to his father and said, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. 
Now, do you understand how crazy of a question that is for that younger son to ask? Essentially, he was saying to his father, Dad, you're better to me dead than alive because I know you have an inheritance for me, so just give me my money and I'm going to leave. Amazingly, the father gives him the money. And so he goes off and spends it in all sorts of wild living. Buys what he wants, drinks what he wants, eats what he wants, sleeps with whoever he wants, until the money runs out. And he's working for a farmer, feeding pigs, and longing to eat the slop that he's feeding the pigs. He thinks to himself, man, what happened? I had such a good plan. I knew what I was going to be, I knew what I was going to do. And it all came crashing down. So I thought to himself, I'll go back to my father. It's really the only option I have. I won't ask to be a son anymore. I'll just ask to be a hired hand, like a servant in the house. All I need is a roof over my head and just a meal to eat every day. So he starts his trek home, rehearsing his speech in his head. Father, I am no longer willing to be called your son, or uh, no longer worthy to be called your son. But as the father sees him from a distance, he starts running which would be a very undignified thing for an adult man in that culture to do. In fact, if anyone would have seen him, they would have shielded shielded their eyes, almost as if he was naked running in front of them. And yet he did it, so that he could wrap his arms around his son, and before his son could even get the speech out of his mouth, say, you're home. Come on in, we're going to put new clothes on you, we're going to kill the fattened calf, we're going to have a party because you were gone and now you're here. You're back with me where you belong. That whole time, though, the older brother had stayed home, working hard for his dad, doing whatever his dad asked. And so when he heard this commotion starting in the house, a party for his younger brother who had said to his father, you're as good as dead to me, I'm going to go spend all your money. Well, the older brother got a little ticked. So he calls his father and says, Father, I have been working for you all these years, and I have not even asked for so much as a small gathering with my friends. And yet you throw a party for that guy? The father says to him, My son, you have always had me. But your brother was lost, and now he's found. What Jesus is trying to teach by this story is that there are really two types of people in the world, but they both have the same problem. There are those who think they're pulling it off, like the older brother. Those who are doing enough good for themselves, for their family, for their community, for their employer, and for God. Sure, they're not perfect, but at least they're still trying. And then there are people like the younger son, who have thrown away a lot of the good things of their life, who have squandered them in wild living, who have done whatever felt right at the time with whoever it felt right to do it with. And God says they have the same problem. They both think their relationship with God depends on their actions. The older brother thinks that his good actions make him deserve God's love. The younger think that his actions disqualifies him from God's love. And yet, what does the father do in the story? He says, all I want is for you to be with me. It's not about what you've done or what you haven't done. It's not about whether you've pulled it off or blown up the trailer. I just want you with me. And he was so willing to restore that relationship between you and him that in the same way that the father ran undignified to his son, Jesus Christ ran not just to be with you, not just to hug you, but to die for you. To lower himself from God in heaven to human on earth so that he could give his life in your place. To undignify himself, inconvenience himself, suffer himself for you. That's the nature of God's unshakable love. And that, brothers and sisters, is so unique. It it reminds me of a a quote from Jan Martel's book, The Life of Pi. Maybe you've read it or seen the movie. Pi is recounting a conversation that he had with Father Martin about the nature of Christianity, and here's what he says. 
He says, once a dead God, always a dead God, even resurrected. The son must have the taste of death forever in his mouth. The Trinity must be tainted by it. There must be a certain stench at the right hand of God the Father. The horror must be real. Why would God wish that upon himself? Why not leave death to the mortals? Why make dirty what is beautiful or spoil what is perfect? Love. That was Father Martin's answer. Just think about the nature of the Christian faith for a second. What does this whole thing that we're doing center on? It centers on God going out of his way for you. Where every other God, every other religion, every other worldview, even if it doesn't call itself a religion, is constantly asking more from you. Do this, say this, be around these people, follow this person, light the right candles, say the right words at the right times. God doesn't do that. Book of Romans earlier in chapter 5 says, while you were still sinners, Christ died for you. Christ, the the God in heaven who created the world absolutely perfectly the way he wanted to, intricately putting all the pieces together so it would work perfectly, saw it broken by human sin and yet still chose to step into it. He could have backed off and said, that's their problem, let them burn themselves to the ground, but he didn't. He stepped into it and experienced it in the way it was not supposed to work. You've only known the broken world. He knew what it was supposed to be like. And he still stepped into it. And not just to suffer in in our life like we do right now, but to die. To do something that God had never done before because God was the source of life. Forever to have that taste in his mouth of what death was like. Why? Love. That's completely unique. Nothing else in this world is going to offer you that kind of unshakable love. A love that is a done deal. Not dependent on whether you do the right things or you commit to the right causes, but already freely given to you, just waiting for you to believe it. And I'll tell you that that unique gospel can change your life. Maybe if you were at a soccer camp, you remember this story, the story of the list. The story of a, a newly married husband and wife. A couple days after their wedding, a husband gave to his wife a piece of paper, and on that paper was a list. A list of things he expected her to do now that she was his wife. Things like make sure the counters are wiped every day. Make sure the floors are swept every other day. Make sure the sheets are changed once a week. And she was a good woman. She wanted to do this for her husband. But sometimes she forgot. Or sometimes things got busy. Or sometimes the job required two people and well, she couldn't do it every day. Eventually this angered her husband and as you can imagine, their marriage didn't last. But a couple years later, she remarried to a man who didn't give her a list but gave her unconditional love who went out of his way to do things for her, to spend time with her, to give things to her, to forgive her and love her even when she wasn't able to do things around the house. And after a decade or so of this beautiful, happy marriage, she pulled out an old purse from the closet and found the list. And she looked up and down the list and she realized she was doing the things on the list. But not because it was a list, not because she had to, but because she was so loved by her husband that she wanted to do these things for him. Sometimes people say to me, well, Christianity is just like all the other religions. They all basically say the same thing, right? Love your neighbor, be good to people, don't kill each other, don't steal things. And that's sort of true, except for Christianity reverses the narrative. Every other world religion says, do and you will be loved. Christianity says you are loved, and as a result, you will want to do. God's love has never been dependent on on whether you fulfill some list that he put together. In fact, your love from God is unshakable, given freely to you with no questions asked. But let me tell you, friends, when you start to experience that love, it will change your heart. It's one thing to know God's love, It's another thing to experience it. 
You may know that the Christians are the ones who talk about forgiveness of sins. But that's not enough. Until you experience what forgiveness feels like. To be so wrong, but then to be so loved. You won't have your heart melted. It, it's like the difference of me telling you honey is sweet and you tasting honey in your mouth. Jesus said that through the scriptures, taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience this kind of love. The Israelites experienced it as they were exiled into Babylon. The people who gather here regularly at Cross of Life, they experience it through God's preached word and through his sacraments. They experience an unshakable foundation that allows them to love each other in ways that they would never have done so otherwise. To give up their time and their energy and their money, not because God has forced them to do it, but because they can't think of any other way to live their life. The nature of God's unshakable love is that it's free. And the uniqueness of it will set you on a different path where you will live like no one else. So here's the truth. Though the mountains be shaken or the hills be removed, God's unfailing love for you will not be shaken. His covenant of peace will not be removed. Believe it. It's yours. Amen.